welcome to this interview with uh, Tim Lewins, author of Darwin, part of the Routledge Philosophers series. Charles Darwin is primarily thought of as a botanist and naturalist rather than a philosopher, although he was thought of as such during his lifetime. Why should we consider his philosophy important? Well, it's true that Darwin aspired to be what he called a, a philosophical naturalist. For him that didn't so much mean a naturalist who also did philosophy, it really meant someone who wouldn't just be content with offering a, a catalogue of the species mm. that inhabit the earth, someone who'd also want to offer some kind of rationale for why it is that we see the species that we do, why they resemble each other in the ways that they do, why they differ from each other in the ways that they do, settle that in the context of some kind of grand explanatory theory, and of course that's exactly what Darwin ended up doing. Um, and it's there, I think, that in some ways we can also begin to see why it is that Darwin is interesting for modern philosophy, because Darwin himself was also very enthusiastic about the ability of his theory to engage productively with what we might think of as grand philosophical questions, particularly questions about the origins uh, of morality, um, for example. And those kinds of questions uh, about how to set morality in the context of an understanding of humans as evolved species just like any other species that we may find on the planet is, is something which has been of incredible interest to, to philosophers in, in recent years as well. Um, what do you think people find most surprising about Darwin's philosophy? Uh, I mean, I think for me one of the most surprising things about Darwin is how un-Darwinian Darwin turns out to be at certain key points. For example, as I've already suggested, Darwin thinks that his theory has extreme importance for understanding morality, understanding psychology. But when Darwin applies his own thinking to these questions, it's quite often the case that his idea of natural selection actually occupies very much a backseat role. So one of Darwin's books, The Expression of Emotions in, in Man and Animals, barely mentions natural selection at all, and actually when it does mention natural selection it's to say that it's not very important as far as Darwin's concerned in explaining emotional expression. So uh, Darwin doesn't always think that natural selection is the most important force affecting our species and others. You expect Darwin to be a kind of Victorian version of Richard Dawkins, but actually he's really rather different in, in some crucial respects. Who or what was the biggest influence in the development of his ideas and why? Darwin had, I think, quite well-developed views about scientific method about what it was that a scientific theory needed to do uh, in order to earn our, uh, our credence, in, in order to, to be well, uh, well evidenced. And Darwin got those ideas, I think, primarily uh, from, from Herschel. Um, Darwin also, I think, is influenced in terms of his approaches to morality by, by philosophers like David Hume uh, and Adam Smith. So he's drawing influences from, from a number of, of, of different areas then. Uh, his work's been hugely influential and has developed a lot since his lifetime. Do you think it's going to continue to be as influential? Um, is there more we can continue to learn from his legacy? I definitely think it's going to continue to be influential. One of the uh, interesting things about Darwin is that it's uh, very hard to say precisely which direction that influence runs. Um, and that's because you very often find, and this I think continues to be the case right now, you very often find that when there are squabbles between modern biologists over contentious cases of how we're supposed to understand evolution, Questions like, does natural selection only ever act at one level, or can natural selection act at multiple levels altogether? Questions like, does natural selection lead to progress, or is progress a notion that should be anathema to the modern biologist? What you find is modern biologists absolutely reaching for Darwin over and over again, and each side in a dispute will often try and claim Darwin for their own team. So Darwin is undoubtedly having influence here in the sense that he's a resource that modern biologists are reaching for. But he's not having influence in just one direction. He's often having influence in contradictory directions. So you'll find, for example, Richard Dawkins saying natural selection typically acts at just one level and Darwin thought that too. 
while Stephen Jay Gould says natural selection acts at many levels, and Darwin thought that too. Right now, uh, there are very interesting questions about whether or not what's often called the modern synthesis, the alleged orthodoxy among modern biologists, needs to be extended in various kinds of ways. And again, the folk who are arguing in terms of extension often again look to Darwin and try and claim Darwin as an early exemplar of a rather more, uh, rather more eclectic pluralistic uh, approach to evolution. So I, I think there's no doubt at all that Darwin will continue to be influential. That doesn't mean that we can look to Darwin and say these are the specific ideas that will carry on having influence because Darwin as a resource is, is used in many, many ways by often conflicting factions right now.